Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 27. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, uh, episode 27, extracting the signal from the noise every week, dropping bombs, some breadcrumbs, some scoops. Yeah. Um, total yeah. busy week, very busy week. Google Cloud Next 23 just ended from San Francisco, and uh, it was an amazing show, and there's so much news to go through. Again, action-packed week of content. You know, we're getting our groove swing on the 27 um, weeks of straight podcasting. Haven't missed it. Um, a lot of people uh, dropping me a dime saying they like the podcast, like how we drop little nuggets in there from what's on our mind. Kind of like rumor mill meets some scoops developing and a lot of things are happening. You know, um, I got to say, you know, there's some earnings coming out. The economy is obviously a factor. Um, you had the presidential debate, Republican Party, and, you know, they didn't include, um, you know, the senator, um, the uh, person from Texas, they wouldn't sign the thing politics, they wouldn't sign the supporting Donald Trump. So he, they didn't allow him in the debate. We saw tons of generative AI action at Google Cloud. Just to me, the big story this week was the, the cloud wars. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, it's happening in the arena right now. Google Next just had their annual conference, and this was a Google Next that's been changed significantly over the past six months. The complete bit has been flipped. Remember Sundar Pakai sent that code red um, memo that said, hey, you know, we're not going to lose out on AI. We basically invented it. We've been doing a ton of it. He didn't say that, but that's basically- their This philosophy. is our house. <laughs> it's, a, it's a home game. We don't want to lose on the home, home field advantage. I mean, that was a home field advantage opportunity for Google. Their investment in AI is well documented. They do a lot of stuff. They write the papers. They have deep mind and all that other great deep learning you know, um, talent um, for search. And they just had to go in and cobble it together. But they definitely put it front and center. It was all about AI. And it puts a clear stark in, in, in comparison to the Amazon Web Services lead. And again, AWS reinvents coming days. So we're going to see... Um, we're going to talk to Adam Slusky exclusively. We're going to have some good questions for him. But AWS is literally going to be under a lot of pressure. And, I, and I've never said this before, um, but I actually think AWS is at risk of getting knocked down a few pegs because there is competition and then the fierce, right? What I saw with Google was they're lining up. And they, they got some competitive strategy in there. They took direct shots at AWS, direct shots at Microsoft from a strategy and execution standpoint, and they moved the ball down the field. They moved the needle, and then they got the ecosystem. So the, you know, they could pull the trifecta of, of cloud moves and then move up position, if not one, if not down the road, to, to get the top spot. And, and you, you remember last year when we had our session with Adam Solipsky, he talked about large language models. This is before the chat GPT announcement. It was before reInvent and they didn't announce it at reInvent, but it's not like they weren't working on it. I, I think, you know, I think it's more of a PR issue, frankly, John, I think it's somewhat overblown. I do think Amazon is going to have a tougher time stitching together all the bespoke pieces. Whereas, yeah. I mean, you were at Google next. I wasn't there. I was, <laughs> I was fucking off at the racetrack, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, it seemed to me, John, that your point about the trifecta, one of those is solutions. And I think Google seemed to do a really good job of providing some solutions, yeah. uh, Duet in particular. Uh, and it's like low code and no code has been so elusive uh, for years, but boy, was it front and center this past week. I, I was I was impressed. I've been studying up for, for yeah. breaking analysis today and they crushed it. You know, the... Um... The information had a story. It's not really a scoop, but you know they try to position as they have the inside scoop. But we've actually reported on this way before they did, um, and so it's well documented that 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 the story's already been out there. It's titled "How AWS Stumbled in AI, Giving Microsoft an Opening," and it's it's a non-story about that they kind of got beat by Microsoft on ChatGPT and OpenAI, but you know, that they had something going on. Of course they had something going on. That's what Amazon basically said to everybody at the, when the whole thing went down. They said, we're not new new to AI. They had something going on. They've had something going on for years. And like Google, but maybe not as much, but pretty close, Amazon had AI and all over their other businesses. So, you know, they're very savvy with natural language processing and all the tech involved in the data and AI. The generative AI piece in particular is a weak link in the sense of they don't have the foundation model dominance that OpenAI has and that Microsoft has beat them to the punch in integrating it in. Google basically did the same thing with Duet and their Vertex AI platform is positioning to go up head to head against AWS. 
Uh, and, then, and and that's and that's a good thing for Google and it's a good thing for competition. And remember, Andy Jassy always told me privately and on the cube, competition's good for Amazon. They like it. They don't mind it. They say bring it on. And you know the the difference is the culture is going to be can Amazon handle the competition? Um, you know, Andy always used to say we got to up our game. We got to play better. He's a competitive person, Dave. You know, we we've had many yeah, one on ones with Andy, and he always subscribed to the notion that competition makes you better. And I think well, it does. Amazon should take that approach. But I got to tell you, from a public perception standpoint, the way they're treating their partners, their friends, they're not. They're looking scared, and I think that is a legit complaint about Amazon right now. Is that they got to play more confident ball? They got to up their game. And they got to move the needle and they have to have needle moving things that hit. And Rob Streche from the Cube Collective and I were talking with Dustin Kirkland at Google Next. And, you know, reinvents right around the corner, Dave. They got all that content pretty much going in the can in the next week or two. They probably have some directional content pretty much done. They got to have all that stuffed in the in the in the bag ready to go in, in about a month. I think so, it's I think it's I think it's uh, more blind spots that they might have, John. Just sort of my my take on it because I think they've been so successful and so powerful and they've been able to sort of dictate the game. And I think, you know, look, when, when, when companies get that strong and that profitable in yeah. any business, you know, yeah. whether it's ecosystems or competitions, they say, hey, I want a piece of that action. You yeah. can't treat me like that. <laughs> you know, only we can treat us like that. But then to your point about competition, you know, uh, OpenAI announces a business version of ChatGPT, which puts them in direct competition with Microsoft. And if you look at the ETR, survey data, OpenAI yeah. has the number one momentum on its products, higher yeah. than even Snowflake was at its peak, like 88% net score, which is a measure of spending momentum, higher yeah. than even Microsoft, and Microsoft's uh -huh. basically GPT. So it's pretty, yeah. you know, OpenAI the, is pretty amazing. The uh, the hype cycle's massive, and the, and the hype cycle's matching the traction. So yeah, in the right. developer community, and, and I, when I say trifecta for Google, what I meant in particular is, and this is the breakdown of how I see Amazon, and and I'm sorry, Google competing with both Amazon and and Microsoft. Remember, Google's number three, and they're punching up, and you know they basically came out and looked cool and re relevant. So you know the shows always have that vibe. But I was sold. I was drunk on the AI story all week. It was a very intoxicating uh, intellectually to see Google hitting all the right notes on the event. But you peel back to the onion; they still got to execute. So Amazon is still number one. They're executing flawlessly. But I'll tell you how Google was taking their shots, and this is why I like the show. The trifecta includes developers, solutions, and ecosystem. The three areas that Google put on the track clearly, and were focused on developers. They were taking a developer tone and posture that was basically saying, and I was talking about this on the cube, that we're going to hit and win the young up and coming generational developers. That's anyone under the age of 30, say 35, but say 30. Uh, and we're gonna be the AI cloud for them. And, and if you look at the engineers that are out there now writing code, a lot of them are under the age of 30. This takes, say, say you're 27 years old, or you're 25 or say 21 and 22 in the dorm room. That demographic, Dave, is has used Google Docs when they were in middle school. Okay, so they're used to Gmail. They're used to the workspaces accounts. They're knowing, and they can just click a button, and it's like instead of commenting on a thing, you say write code. Your kids have Office on their laptops. And it's like, it's like no, they're like they Dad, that's, that's 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 boomer <laughs> software. Office is for boomers. Okay, so you know Microsoft's the boomer cloud. Okay, and and that's for old IT. If AI changes IT, Google could mop that up and they have to win that. They also had laid down that they're going to target legacy environments. So one of their keynotes, they had a, a, a poem and musical on stage around legacy land. You know, the, the, the destination of the future can be changed. So that was the developer side. So there, that's a direct strike at Microsoft, I mean, AWS, because AWS always had the developers from day one, Twitter started on AWS, Airbnb started on AWS, all those startups in that generation of that era were Amazon because there's only one alternative that was do a data center. So AWS was the only game in town for those startups. Today, it's much different. If we're in a dorm room coding, what's the first thing that comes around? You got multiple choices now. AWS, Google, Azure, Oracle, other potential. So that 
means that Amazon isn't the default must have and their enterprise growth has brought them into the very enterprise game. And so my advice to uh, uh, the team over there is you have to win the startups and Amazon is great with startups. We, you know, the startup showcase that we do, they got to make that better. They can't lose the startups, Dave. If they lose the startups, they lose that generation. They got to get back in the game and very be cool and relevant in the startups. And Google looked pretty damn good with what they had going on. So well, that's and I, I again, I think the low code aspects of what they're doing with with Duet was really interesting because it expands the number of so-called developers, right? So they got the Vertex yeah. AI <laughs> for hardcore developers, even Duet for developers. They've got yeah. great great tool chain. And so yeah. that was very impressive to me, but I still feel like, you know, it's always recency bias at these things. You come off a show and you're like, wow, that was a pretty yeah. good show. Cause these guys put a lot of effort and time and thought into it and they're smart. I, I gotta believe John that, yeah. that AWS is, they've got to crush reInvent if they don't. They, they, got, they, got, they got to crush reInvent, but that, but that trifecta one developers, okay. That is a, uh, that's targeting Microsoft's core. I mean, AWS is core. The second area of the trifecta is the solutions. Now, Rob Stretche pointed this out on theCUBE is that Amazon's got services. They got higher level services, thousands of services, hundreds of services, depending what number you want to call service. They have either hundreds or thousands, but hundreds a of lot. Really good, a lot. They got a lot. Google yeah. has a lot of services too, but they're focusing on solutions. And that is the direct strike at Microsoft's core, right? So from a competitive strategy standpoint, developers is targeting the core of AWS and the solutions targets the core of Microsoft. And with, Amazon. With, Amazon's and, not a and, solutions company, right? I mean, generally. No, no, but they're not competing on that. Well, that's an advantage over Microsoft too, but Microsoft wins with the services. That's one of their competitive advantages. Some say they should do solutions, but Microsoft had to put a dent in, in AWS because they have solutions. That's their strong suit. So Google solutions, targets more Microsoft being more their packaging. I'll give you an example. Workspaces is the modern suite. Again, the example of you know the younger generation, the boomer, the boomer suite versus the the next gen uh, millennial or Z suite. So that's the solutions. That is that's smart by Google because they don't want to compete against Amazon on features. They'll lose on services. You can't go head to head on an attack. So from a again competitively, this is where I think this is why it matters, right? And then three ecosystem. All three clouds have to have an ecosystem to be in that one or two position. You got to have a growing, vibrant, money-making ecosystem and to put the solutions together. And Google had that on the floor. The GSIs were, well, they were, they were beaming with like glee. They were like happy. They are making money and they they have, the cloud is in the position to, to make services. So again, that's. About time with the GSIs, don't you think? I mean, geez, I mean. It's it's been a long time coming, and the, those guys, as I like to say, they like to eat at the trough. And so you know, if they're there, smiling, they're making money. And there was also it looked like a number of smaller like CSPs, like telcos, like an Orange, that Google was encouraging to use the Google Kit, the Google Stack, around yeah. the globe. So I thought that was kind of cool. And yeah. um, and and then the other thing too is you know the one thing about Google's ecosystems, it's uh, you know unlike. AWS and to a lesser extent Microsoft, but like AWS, you, got, you see Snowflake, you see Databricks, you see you know a lot of data database players. Whereas Google, you know, really trying to push BigQuery, but you still see the periphery of of the data plays there. So Google's trying to get people onto its data data stack, and and so that's that, that's interesting, right? Because you got to use that stack to get a lot of the advantages of their, for instance, their TPUs and they're not GPU constrained, but you got to use yeah. their stack. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting strategy. Like we wrote about it last week in breaking analysis that, you know, Snowflake has momentum with AWS and Microsoft, maybe not so much for Google <laughs> uh, because yeah. Google doesn't want, you know, to give up its its place in database. So Google, get a home, Google hit a home run by putting Duet, which is their AI, feature in all products. They had it in security, they had it in infrastructure, they had it in the database, they had stuff even with all the looker stuff. And then they had clear areas where the, the, the partners can compete. So not a lot of channel conflict there when there's growth. So the do it AI wasn't just a consumer feature, obviously workspace is exploding in, in value, Gmail and now paid suite is gonna be things. So I, my, I think that Google's gonna embed, you know, authoring, and, and make the Google interface of workspace like Google Docs and productivity suites, make that the coding environment uh, for democratizing coding. I think if they do that, 
you know, if we're in a dorm room, we're going to sit around drinking beer, building a company or building an app, we're going to pop in. It's going to be like we never left workspace. It, it looks okay. like Google's architecture is conducive to just as what you said is embedding things like Duet and AI directly into their solutions in a way that, you know, eliminates a lot of these complex data pipelines and connectors. So you've got like a single source yeah. of data at the core that all these tools and solutions can access that's that's essentially in real time or near real time. This thing we've been talking about, people, places, and things in real time. And, and so that's something that, you know, I don't see out of AWS. I, I'm not as familiar with, with Microsoft, but it seems like there's some abstractions there. I don't think Microsoft's got the architecture to do that, but Google, I think, built that from the ground up. The other thing I wanted to get your take on this is, George, I think it was George Curry said, it's almost like they're turning the, the weakness into a strength, you know, if it can't fix it, feature it. He said, customers are telling us that they want to work with a company that has the leading edge tech, right? That was always the sort of line on Google. They get the best tech, but they don't know how to sell it. And so they're sort of flipping that saying, hey, we are the cool kids cloud and the best tech, so work with us. Yeah, so a lot of action, Dave. So we we, we, we talked a lot about the, the cloud. Google Next was a home run for them. So congratulations to Google. It's it's finally time to see them come together with the AI story. It was it's kind of it was it was it, they did a lot of work on that. And I think they laid a future roadmap that's pretty clear. And it was it was really more about the that Google's not out of the game at all. In fact, they could probably accelerate and and maybe maybe take some territory and move up a position uh, really quickly if they hit on all those trifectas. Still behind they, now they, they're, they're, still, they're still they're still one fifth the revenue of AWS. Had a long yeah, way to go. Uh, yeah. Well, they have, they're playing the same playbook Microsoft's doing, Dave. They're adding all that revenue from workspace and, you know, start making that part of the feature. Again, Amazon has yet to do, do that. They don't have yet to have that numbers on the top of the stack. It's their ecosystem. Right. So it's going to be, again, it's very, Amazon's still number one and, and they're going to be there for a long time. And by the way, Amazon is executing. So we'll see. They have to crush reInvent. Um, okay. So let's go, let's go look at the enterprise pulse, Dave. You got a lot of action going on. You got fundings and, and earnings. Databricks looks like they're going to try to raise money. A new report says, they're going to do a new funding at a valuation of 43 billion from Bloomberg. And apparently um, the caveat is we're still in talks, not sure that's going to happen. That's in direct conflict to our report that we think that that was an insider round. So uh, interesting dynamics here, Dave. So uh, posturing or reality, we'll see. Uh, but um, I think so. I think Databricks has a, their balance sheet is, is strong, but maybe, you know, who knows? You can't tell because they're a private company, but 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 you know they did that mosaic ML deal supposedly at like a twenty eight billion dollar valuation even though the number was like whatever one point three billion uh, yeah. one point four billion so it was really cut that in half so really seven hundred and fifty million and then if they now get this valuation boost uh, that's that's great news for Databricks. Amazon made Amazon nice made discount. a small little acquisition with Fig command line for developers that came from the more of the open source team uh, Cube alumni. Rockset reels in 44 million uh, for real-time analytics, Dave. That's interesting. That's a good for them. I'd like to see uh, some of our early startup showcase uh, players uh, getting the big fat funding. Um, yeah. And then earnings, ups and down. Dell, Nutanix oh continue God. the string of upbeat earnings. Broadcom share fall on lower than expected outlook. While VMware more or less meets the forecasts. <laughs> right? MongoDB smashes earnings uh, forecast, Dave. Okay, the new AI features are panning out for Mongo, and then Salesforce shrugs off expectations there by beating expectations. Shrugs off, shrugs off uh, the, the economic pressure by saying we're cool. We, we beat the, we beat the market, and we're beating the expectations. So big yeah. earnings week. So Dell Dell was up twenty one percent the day after yeah. earnings. Well, but HP was, also HP also announced too, right? They fell. Yeah, but HP basically flat revenue, but Dell's revenue dropped 13% to 23 billion, but it was a $2 billion beat on the top line. And there's a huge, I guess, a $2 billion backlog of AI servers, but their their ISG was down, which is servers and storage. Servers was down 18%, storage was down 3%, PCs were down 16%. The stock was up 21% because they, they beat and they raised. So there you go, that's all about the consensus. Mongo had a great quarter, I thought, 423 million in the top line grew 40%. Salesforce beat uh, uh, Pure. Storage had a had a decent beat. Uh, but here's the thing about Pure. I always said Pure Storage is the 
the one-eyed man in the land of the storage blind, right? They, they're growing at six and a half percent storage, you know, not the greatest business, not like it used to be. Uh, you see, you see Dell's, which is formerly EMC's storage business is, is, is declining. Um, but, but still, you know, they chug along uh, with pure and they, they beat, they beat their EPS by a little bit, but they don't really make a lot of money. Crowds, the big, the big story on earnings to me was the, the cyber guys. CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike grew 37%. O mm -hmm. Okta grew 23%. They beat by 21 million. Both those stocks are up. Sentinel One, which is supposedly going private, they beat. So all the all the uh, cyber stocks it was a great day the other day. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. And Rubric is supposedly getting ready for an IPO. Here's a company that was a backup company, data protection. And Bipul Sinha, the CEO, pivoted the entire company to cybersecurity. And he probably, yeah. you know, boosted his valuation by a billion dollars. <laughs> I know. That's, and they're yeah. going to go public. You see, that's just killer. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome for them. So, you know, what I wonder what Cohesity does, Dave. You got Cohesity. You got Druva. You know, looks like. Well, Ruba's you just interviewed uh, Sanjay Poonin. Right, I they're readying. They, they're trying to get ready for an IPO, right? Sanjay mm -hmm. was kind of coy on that. You know, he didn't reveal. I tried to pre pepper a little bit, but you know, he was given all the signs that business is great over there, cohesity. So, you know, he says they're doing great, and um, I don't know what's going on with Druva. Uh, I will tell you this: you look at the ETR data, Rubric, and so cohesity and Rubric uh, about two years ago were very similar in terms of momentum. Rubric create a distance. And I think that's why they brought in San, Sanjay Poonin to really shore up the, the go to market. But but they have some work to do, it seems to me. It's hard to tell because they're private yeah. companies. So you got to use, you know, triangulation and rumor and data and survey data. Uh, but but I wonder, John, if maybe Cohesity is, is you know, there was rumors that they were going to sell. There was rumor that IBM was going to buy them, which, you know, I don't know. I just don't see IBM investing more in storage, even though it's software. Um, I think they want to try to move up the stack further, although they got a good relationship with Cohesity. So maybe the talk of IPO is a is a red herring to get acquired. I don't know. Well, we'll see. I mean, so earnings are going good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, Dave. What do you think about the uh, the enterprise market right now? I mean, what what does the data tell you? We're going into um, the fall. Okay, summer's yeah. this Labor Day weekend, um, and you got a couple of events, but reInvent, Microsoft Ignite's got the big event like a week before reInvent. Microsoft Ignite is their cloud show. They're going to have that the week before reInvent. Microsoft and Amazon, they have to one-up each other now. We're in the one-up game because Google basically laid down, we're cooler than the other guys. Did you hear what Jensen said? No. Jensen said, he actually said that with Google and AI and NVIDIA, we are reinventing the cloud. Uh, he used yeah. that term, phrase, and reinvent at Google Next, which is, I wonder if that was a, was purposeful. Jensen's pretty savvy. You sure he didn't say reimagine? He said reinvent. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hear that. I thought he said reimagine. No, he but, said reinvent. But I mean, he said, he said that, you know, he said the same thing, kind of same thing. He didn't say reinvent at VMware, but he said the same thing. But I, he's pushing this cloud. And by the way, when he announced that at SIGGRAPH, he didn't mention uh, AWS. He mentioned Google and Microsoft as partners. So, you know, I read into that big time. So, well, so you, you asked about the, the market of the enterprise. I think it's really mixed right now. And you've seen it in earnings. Some companies doing well, some aren't. The, the top line spending data suggests that it's still pretty tight. And the spending in AI, I, my premise has always been the last several weeks now and months, is stealing from other areas. It's very clear to me that people are having to make trade-offs. And I think the seesaw economy continues. You know, raising rates, lowering rates, you know, recession, not recession, war, not war, election, confusion. I just think it's really, really uncertain right now. And until the AI kicks in and really drives productivity and the data is clear and, and CEOs have a really clear ROI on that AI investment, I think that could be the catalyst that breaks through. But I think until then, you're going to see an ebb and flow. And I think it's going to be a market for stock pickers and certain winners and certain losers. Yeah. I, I think the startup world is going to continue to boom. I love the market right now on this AI startups. 
You know, I'm such a, a fan of the AI movement because it's so disruptive. It is the web early days, in my opinion, almost a direct mirror of that. And I think the, the business models are going to be very similar. Start out by solving, making the functionality better and better. It's get better and get better. And that is make things simpler, easier to use and faster, cheaper, right? That's the, that was the, that was the advancement in these major inflection points. Okay. That being said, the cloud guys are in the middle of mixing all this. So there, here, the, the real interesting thing is, will the cloud wars have a dampening of the and, and uh, excitement? Because when you start getting into the cloud wars where you got Amazon, Microsoft, and Azure, and Google with trying to woo the developers, who are the startups, it's almost like you got to make platform decisions because each one has their own vector database. Each one has their own AI chat. Each one has their own system um, of databases and whatnot and stacks. So the question is, just like the enterprise would pick one, you got to pick a platform. It's like picking an iPhone or, or Android, right? You got to. So this is an interesting conversation. For the first time on the queue, we've had this conversation with the analyst angle session where we talked about this publicly for the first time, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's kind of like the web from an economic and growth standpoint and from an industry, but. For a developer, you got to make a choose. You got a choice. You got to choose. So, and that's so that's going to be that could be the secret flaw in the industry. Developers shouldn't have to choose. Okay, they should just be able to choose what they want. Not be told I got to be with Amazon and then can't move. If I got vector embeddings that don't work on one cloud, and and I want to leverage that on another uh, AI cloud. It's going to be very weird, Dave, if that's the case. And I can, that's not going to work um, unless someone builds some sort of abstraction layer that makes that go away. Again, back to the making things easier and simpler. So it's good. It's an it's a awesome time for the startups. And I think that's obvious in all the areas around San Francisco, uh, Austin, Texas, um, New York, and not so much Miami compared to those three areas, but uh, it's San Francisco, New York, Austin are the hotbeds right now, and a little bit of LA, then maybe Miami, but not a lot of Miami action with AI startups, Dave. So, and I also like certain sectors. I mean, I think in cyber, it's a consolidation story. So I really like Palo Alto Networks. I really like CrowdStrike. I really like what Zscaler is doing. I was really happy to see Okta come back a little bit because they kind of screwed up that Auth0 acquisition, they paid $7 billion for Auth0 and just never figured out the go to market and that hurt them. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I like Okta, I think they are the identity standard. I think in data, to your point about platforms, it gets really interesting now. I think Snowflake was caught off guard a little bit with Gen AI. Uh, and I think you know, Databricks was in a strong position with, with AI. Uh, you were at the Databricks show, you saw what a good job they did. Snowflake, they're a very competitive company and so, People are making decisions right now about those platforms. And I think the big wild card for both Snowflake and Databricks is you got the cloud players with Gen AI. They have momentum on AI. All three of the big cloud players have pretty strong AI stories. You could debate, you know, AWS maybe a little bit behind, you know, maybe not, but, but all three have, have great AI stories and mixed data platforms. I would say Google has the strongest data platform. You got Amazon with Redshift, Still very competitive. I think not as competitive from a technology standpoint as Google and Databricks and Snowflake, but but, but those a, that AI halo effect could actually give them a little bit more momentum vis-a-vis -vis competing with Databricks and Snowflake. So they're up against, like you say, developers have to make some really big bets right now and decisions, yeah. but but not that they can't you know float, but right now they got to you know put the pedal to the metal and go fast. So. Well, I think we'll see how this plays out from a compet competition with the cloud wars, but ultimately that could be the case where, you know, you're gonna, they're going to be able to differentiate on their value of their generative AI suites, Vertex vertex AI versus say Bedrock and SageMaker. And then obviously with, with Microsoft, they have theirs. I love, by the way, they call their, um, their Gen AI thing model, the model garden. That's, it's, yes. uh, it's the model garden. That's their Bedrock, uh, right? So it's it's like it's well it's it's bedrock and SageMaker if you want to kind of look at because they have their own foundation models in there as well as third parties and the open source. So the, again, the other thing is the other thing is silicon, right? I mean, Nvidia obviously very strong. It was it's interesting to hear the all in guys talk about how your, Nvidia is going to get all this competition and all this VC funding, and they talk about Risk Five competing. I, I mean, I just think Nvidia has such a lead. I don't think AMD. Yeah. And Intel are going to be able to to catch up to Nvidia anytime soon. 
given the software investments they've made. They also, Chamat, like shit all over ARM. I, I'm not crazy about the ARM IPO. I do think it's overvalued. He said it's worth 10 billion. I don't think that's that's true at all. I think ARM made an announcement. Those those guys said all in should just stick to the, what they, stick, stay away from the enterprise. But ARM made no an offense. announcement no on Monday. I don't know if you saw this. The Neoverse Compute Subsystem, new line of products offering offerings from ARM designed to help partners deliver specialized silicon faster at lower cost and risk compared to traditional system on chip development. This is a huge, this is like the, the coup de grace to x86. I mean, it's just, it's like, it may be the nail in the coffin. Um, and and I, I'll just give you this. It used to be five years to develop a chip to get the tape out. ARM took that down to 18 months using the example of Tesla and Apple. They just cut that in half again. And so, so ARM is like, it's not the greatest, it's a, it's a really interesting business model because it's pure software, it's pure license revenue, uh, and they make like 98% gross margins, but their revenue's not growing, you know, so you, they're not really a huge growth story because they have this sort of open ecosystem model. And what it does, it's a nice business and it completely screws up the, the traditional x86 business because it's really, really disruptive. And I think, the point I'm trying to get to is, I think the what's going to disrupt NVIDIA, and I want to get Floyer out of retirement <clears throat> to do another breaking analysis of him because he's all over this stuff. I think the disruption to NVIDIA could come from the edge. It's from Apple. It's from you know ARM at the edge. And if you look at who's doing really interesting things with system on chip, it's 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 NVIDIA with big big ass yeah. systems, and it's and it's Apple. And I think that could be, um, you know, an interesting challenge from edge economics bleeding into the data center. That's why I was always excited about the NVIDIA ARM acquisition. That might've been game over. Yeah. I mean, the processor wars, the Silicon wars are going to happen, happening. Um, but yeah, the, the Google has the TPUs, the tensor processing units, which is their version of chip uh, and GPUs working together. They were really flaunt in that Dave and I think I think it's gonna be whoever can make the stuff go faster and and make the life easier for the applications for generative AI is going to be the winner and I think that could be it could be the case that the clouds have their own game and that they can differentiate on that and go head to head as an arms race and uh and that arms race should benefit developers if it hurts developers then we can keep an eye on that but right now that's one one thing we have to watch the developer traction with generative AI is so strong um, the 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 revolution of apps that will be AI based. It'll be based on data, and the demos are going to look a lot different at reInvent this year uh, than they I, were last year. I, I got a text. Somebody texted me, George. I think Gilbert texted me today. The title of the chart doesn't have the, any data on it, but it's it's got lines. It says total advanced chips added, and there's a blue line with Google TPU version five Viper, which is called Viper Viperfish, and then there's an orange line. It's called OpenAI Total GPUs, and it looks like in Q three, just right about now, there's a crossover point, and Google like rockets up to the right and surpasses OpenAI Total GPU. So to your point, you know Google's got some really interesting, you know, silicon moves going on that gives them greater optionality, it doesn't make them as reliant on GPUs as everybody else is. Again, the drawback is you got to kind of lock into the Google stack, uh, but you can develop apps in TensorFlow on top of, of Google if you're, if you're GPU constrained. Yeah, well, uh, Dave, just to shift gears to uh, what could be a lead into our rant section, I did try to catch the Republican presidential debate and get some of the highlights um, and, and that went on in between these events and have a chance to watch the whole thing. It's kind of weird. That was embarrassing to watch, but there's one guy that's not on the list is Will Hurd, who I like. He's not, he wasn't even on the, on the uh, panel. Apparently he had to sign a document that said he has to support the candidate no matter what. So that's the classic, you know, whatever candidate is, is put forward, you have to support him and he wouldn't sign it. And for that reason, he wasn't on stage um, on the, during the debate. So, you know, the guy's a computer science guy. And, you know, you know, I know I know that a lot of people are for Vivek, uh, the other guy who's very outspoken. Um, this guy, Will Hurd, is he's against Trump, but he's moderate. He's and they wouldn't let him on this this debating and, stage because he wouldn't he wouldn't sign something. But you saw when they asked him, Brett Baer asked, 
will you support Donald Trump? You know, if he's the yeah. if he's elected, Vivek was like horse shack. You remember that show yeah. in the seventies? <laughs> oh, yeah, and he then was, you know he, he yeah. but at least he you know to his credit he he forced everybody else to put his hand up. And then Chris Christie did that weird thing that everybody saw. He put his hand up and then said no. So did did they sign something? And then and then and Asa Asa Hutchinson also didn't he didn't put his hand up. So those those two guys apparently from what I what I signed heard, it and then and then reneged. Apparently, from what I heard from someone close to the situation, maybe it was it's not well known, but I I'm, I don't even know about it until I talked to someone who's close to him because, you know, there's talk about him coming on the cube. So um, because he's got a CS background, he's he's a fan of the cube, apparently. So he worked for the CIA. Maybe that came from, you know, friends like Keith Alexander, whose company, by the way, is delisting off the exchange. Um, but apparently he's a tech guy. And, you know, me, I've been banging on the drum for years. Like, we need more tech people in Congress. We need more tech people as lawmakers, not less lawyers, right? So so um, apparently he had to sign a piece of paper that said he has to support whoever they put forward. And he wouldn't because he knows that if it's Trump, he doesn't want to support Trump. He's been very critical of Trump and specifically Trump. So he's like, you know, I, I can't sign it with a, yeah, only if it's not Trump. So that's weird. I find that completely weird that they, they wouldn't put him on the stage. He's totally qualified. Okay. He's got a tech background, served in the CIA for a decade, member of the House Representative in Texas for six years. Um, what's wrong with this guy? I like him. I, don't I like any, I like any I like anyone's got a CS degree at this point because right. the world is having tech challenges. And we got China to fight too, by the way. So there's a whole thing around China going on and um you got to have people who know what they're talking about when it comes to tech and you know we don't we don't need another you know blowhard up there you know just getting hate hate speech in every speech that they do i mean the republican debate i thought was embarrassing it was you know it was like r racing for attention sound bites um, it was a bunch of lunatics, in my opinion. So, not something I was really happy to see, honestly. So, well, it's all. I mean, Trump wasn't even there. He's the front runner. So it's it's all these guys trying to, I guess, vie for second place. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's just there's a long way to go. Well, Dave, um, what's your rants for the week? Any any good rants? I I, I guess since you brought it up, I, I my rant is that I think the the similarities are greater than the differences. And these politicians, I think, you know, they're out to to protect their own legacy, to <laughs> to protect their <laughs> their term limits. You know, I, I mean, there aren't term limits, but to, to protect their terms, there should be term term limits. I think, you know, Mitch McConnell needed help on stage. You know, you see, yeah. you see Biden struggling. I mean, certainly Reagan in his second term after he got yeah. shot, struggled. And I and I just I do think there should be you know strong consideration for term yeah. limits. I mean, keep people on as advisors, you know. But I, I think there should be maybe some age limit, on, yeah. or at least term limit on how long you can actually serve. I don't know. There's yeah. an argument against it, but I kind of like to see it. It'll probably never happen because they'd have to vote for it. They'd have to vote themselves yeah. out of office. But my rant, my rant is um, about. Um, the shooting at University of North Carolina this week. So Caroline texted us. Uh, she's, you know, she goes to the UNC. Um, active shooter on campus. Uh, ended up not being a mass shooting. It was a, a PhD student who went and shot his professor who died, by the way. And so it's a very sad oh, situation. Terrible. But the whole, what happened, my rant is, it was what happened, right? It was the first day of school in Chapel Hill. So all the parents taking their kids to school and the school goes on full lockdown. You know, hide under the desk, close the doors. Um, they didn't know where the active shooter was, so everyone freaks out. So you imagine being picking your kids the first day of school, and this is like the normal thing, and everyone didn't know what they do, and it was like, oh, like oh my god. It's just the fact that it's normal. The more the thing that's normal is key. So that that this is a problem where we have overreaction and or underreaction. Either way, it's a, it's a bad situation. My rant is more about how the people in charge respond to this stuff. So the university is freaking out. There's an active shooter on campus and the kids are all, they all have phones, right? So like, they're like reporters. So like 
the the data that was coming in is actually fascinating to actually look at it this way in a weird way. But like the Gen Zs had their own communication network. They basically just essentially flash mobbed and deployed organically a communications network through chats, chats, groups, texts, and through the, the, the network of each other's friends. It was a highly efficient network. They had the guys LinkedIn up on Twitter. Meanwhile, the mainstream media is like fumbling. We don't know who the shooter is. It's on fucking Twitter. Okay, oh. <laughs> and 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 that's one. So that and and then the response from the university was a fail. They're using email, miscommunication. Just they they're fumbling everything. When the students were had to take care of themselves, so there was no real the 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 institution, the people in charge. It's completely mismatched between the the system of how people are communicating, and getting information. So what ended up happening is people were freaking out. Right? They didn't know. Yeah. It, it was an active shooter. Again, it was an isolated incident. But unfortunately, it was bad. But it was wild, right? It was wild to see how scared and being having a daughter there were communicating first party. It was interesting to see how scared it was, right, for everyone. And then the parents thing, that's the whole, like, impact there. Like, that could have been avoided with good information, right? So, so again, so we are in a cluster, you know what, situation. So I found it, like, very interesting how old and antiquated and not functional the communication systems are. And in other words, the students set up their own little ad hoc, you know, network effect. They were comforting each other. So there was no services. You know, they, we have councils available, like bullshit stuff. It's just it just it, it made me realize that how bad the system is it, from a communication standpoint. And God forbid if cell phones go out. So my rant is we got to look at how people communicate in times of crisis, you know, how people can support each other and how we can get to norm, normal normal life faster if, say, a school that's another miles away doesn't have to go into full lockdown mode. Can you imagine the trauma all around here, right? So that could have been avoided if they just isolate. So again, this is more about response, whether that's, you know, uh, public relations, public health. Um, it's just, it's, 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 it's obviously disconnected from the reality of the it situation. It reminds me, what you're talking about, reminds me of um, Desert Storm in 1990. Um, <clears throat> the U.S., uh, you know, Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait, took over their, you know, their oil fields. U.S. came in and George H.W. Bush, Bush one, was the president. And this was back, CNN was kind of just getting started. And they had Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room, and they had, I forget the guy's name, he had a satellite phone, and he was like out on one of the hotels watching the bombs go off, and the President of the United States had to turn on CNN to find out what was happening, right? That was like their CNN moment, like we always talk about the Twitter moment when the plane landed on the Hudson. Uh, that was the CNN moment, and really kind of underscored, you know, the, the new age of communications, which... Now it's clearly social media. You're going to get better information from social media and you create these ad hoc networks, you know, in real time. Um, yeah. Do you remember that, John? In, in, of course. In, yeah. in 1990? I remember, remember those pictures vividly. And then, you know, the elevator shaft, they dropped the bomb on the elevator shaft. They had the technologies like a video game called Crosshairs, drone strike, um, or not drone strike, actually a targeted um, laser missile. Um, yeah, it was, it was a shock and awe. It was, it was interesting. I mean, again, this is... We see it in our business on the media side. There's, there's the new, the new ways to, you know, distribute information and communicate it's happening. It's, that's why I'm, I'm psyched about you know a lot of things we're doing with our collective group on the research side. You know, I think I think the 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 idea of people as community con connective devices provided value, right? In that situation, you know, you had you know information which helped people calm down. People can help each other, nurture each other, have empathy for each other, and 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 get information. And are you safe? And all what to do. So, you know, we yeah, got though, we, wow. we 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 got a lot going on. Uh, by the way, got to get the plug in for SuperCloud Four is coming up uh, in October, and that's going to be dedicated to generative AI. By the way, so you know we we're going to see new apps come out. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. We got CrowdStrike coming up. We got Mandiant event in DC. Um, we got, the SAS, we got the SAS event coming up. You and I are doing that, right? The week before uh, Mandy and CrowdStrike, right? Oh, no, wait. Yeah, yeah. 
We got right. We got Mandian. We got uh, CrowdStrike. That, the SAS show. The SAS show yeah. is next man, week. This month. Yeah. yeah. Two weeks. Unbelievable. All right. Here we go. The summer, oh. we were the busiest summer I could ever remember for the Cube. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't take a vacation. <laughs> it's I December. took two days off this week, went to Saratoga, still have my shirt barely. But, uh, you know, normally I take two weeks off. With, well, yeah, I, I lost a lot of money. I depleted my um, my Breeders' Cup fund. Yeah, well, so. Dave, you know, you sometimes you just got to let loose, you know. It was let fun, it, though. Let, let the weather go. was yeah. great. Upstate New yeah. York in the Adirondacks, saw a bunch of my friends. It was awesome. Had my it's, my wife and my daughter with me. It's well, so much fun. I love I love doing the cube. I wish I missed you at Google. Next, we had Lisa was there. Lisa Martin, Dustin Kirkland, our new contributor analyst, was rocking. Rob he Stretch. looked great. He looked great. Yeah, Rob was nailing it. With Rob Stretch yeah. and leading the the collective has traction. It's awesome to see. I saw yeah. Sanji Mohead. Howie Shu came by, did a selfie. Just the Google Next is cool. they were cool and relevant. I thought they had a home run. And earnings looking good. I think we might be on a, on a rebound, Dave, on the tech. Let's hope these startups that were falling out of the sky can like soft land somehow. If we get the M and A market back, um, we're going to hopefully see some nice teams get acquired, accu hired out. So there's not a lot of carnage in the valley and other entrepreneurial centers. So we'll keep. Where an eye was on Google that. next? It was, I mean, is that Moscone? But where in Moscone? Why was it so tight? It was sold out. It was, but there was only twenty thousand people. It was there, Moscone right? North and South. It was a full Moscone. They didn't use West at all, but they had Moscone North and South. It was packed to the gills. So they could uh, have they could have had more people, but they would have had to open up West. Yeah, they couldn't fit anyone else in that venue. Um, it was packed, and and it was like packed in like a kind of a reinvent way. People were engaging. The floors were packed. You had to kind of swim through the crowd. Um, lunches were fast and gone quickly. If you didn't know, well, Google must yeah, be stoked. Like, they must be pumped at this having yeah. such a successful show. You know, I always been critical of Google, and, and I love Google living in Palo Alto for the past 22 years, but I know everyone there and know a lot of ex-Googlers. You know, they're a strong technical company, and they're, they're, they're like AWS in that weird, positive, good way. Like, they're a good weird. They're techies. They do the right thing. Amazon's got their culture, you know, the kind of quirky culture. Google's got their culture, and two great companies, and both doing very innovative things at many levels. And, you know, I've always wondered why Google can't get out of their own way when it came to cloud. Like, why aren't they number one? Like, if I was, if I was running Google, they'd be number one. Okay, it'd be a matter of time, right? So it's just so easy to be number one in cloud. Just be the best cloud. Just get it done. They have the they have the goods. So so a lot of Google's problems, as we've reported, is culture. And, you know, Thomas Curry and took over. Go to market. And, and he had to hey. burn it down and build it back up. But Think about it. They got the best network in the world. They got the best cloud database of any of the three cloud players. You know, you could argue Snowflake and, and Databricks, but but Google BigQuery was was first and truly cloud native. They got good they got good storage. They got their compute is good. They got great yeah. AI. Right. They got apps <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. I think it's been a go-to-market problem. Yeah. So. And, and well they no they simplified and they also they also the 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 there's always been a go-to-market problem and the systems and stuff and the people, but they always had good people, but they could get out of their own way. And the, the complaint that I've always had was they build their Google engineers would build products that they would use. It's the classic, you know, Y Combinator. Well, build products that you would use. Well, guess what? Google people are not normal. They're like high alpha, alpha geeks. So they're, so I think the enterprise is. That's well, true. And, Just and, read Google documentation. You're like, who did yeah. they write this for? Yeah. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Everyone's got a PhD. No, but that, but now they're focused on the enterprise. And, they, and again, the trifecta approach that I put out there from an analysis standpoint is smart because they're targeting the the core of each of their competitors above them on the rack, on the, on the standings, in a way that's going to put pressure on them and, and potentially pull business from, from their to get share. So, and of course, the ecosystem is, is, is a formula. They're getting it right. If they, and if they pull it off, and again, it looks good in the show, but when you put it into practice, you got to execute. All right. So they're they're not at the Amazon Web Services level of execution, but but if they do what even they're laying out half of it, it's going to be a game changer. So, well, Dave, we're going to see you. You and I are doing a show together at SAS, uh, yeah. and we'll do a show. I'm hopefully um, take a visit out to Boston, maybe the next week or the week after um, to kind of catch the end of the summer, early fall, and. Uh, Great stuff. So this is episode 27, signing off. Uh, check out siliconangle.com, cube.net.
and send us a DM. You want to have give us input on the show? Let us know.